Um, this session here is search-based recommendations at Politico. Um, the speaker will be Ryan Cole. He's an architect at Politico. Ryan spends his time building systems having to do with search, recommendation, natural language processing, and analytics. In his prior lives, he has also worked with semantic web technologies, machine learning, ice cream, and grocery bagging techniques. <laughs> Please welcome Ryan. Hey guys, so, uh, that's loud. Um, so we're just gonna cover uh, something that we built last year at Poetico. So I'm gonna start with kind of describing what our business is and move into the problem that we had within that business and what we wanted to solve. After that, I wanted to cover real quick what the evaluation criteria were. Finally, we started with the prototype system and then we learned that that wasn't quite what we wanted to build. And now the important part is that we built something that was non-standard. And so, spoilers, it, we're really happy with it. But there's still that weird feeling in the back of our heads, are we missing something big? Like, is our evaluation wrong, which is what drove us to a non-standard system? So any feedback along any of those lines would be really helpful. Um, the Business Overview, we're a news agency. We do very wonky politics stuff. We break it up into two segments. Um, one is what we call the core site, and that's for all of us sitting here, just people who have some interest in politics. It's going to be at a more uh, generally accessible level compared to our subscriber site. Our subscriber site is way in the weeds about what the Appropriations Committee for Department of Transportation stuff things cared about that day, it's really important for some companies, like lobbyists, congressional staffers, uh, big companies that want to sell the government on airplanes and things like that. So it becomes what our, uh, some of our folk call more intelligence than news. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be focusing on the subscription site. When we look at volume for stories that we publish every day, our subscription site um, is going to provide roughly one to 200 pieces of news per day. What's a little weird about our site compared to other news agencies is that we mostly have the weekends off. A lot of newspapers, you know, Sunday is their big thing. We're all digital and most people just clock out of politics on Saturday and Sunday. And so we have very few things going on except maybe breaking news or uh, things like that. We, uh, as a business, we sell subscriptions to our site in terms of verticals. We're going to sell that to companies. So we identify an account, like Boeing comes to us, and they're like, hey, we would be interested in stuff. And we're like, well, that's great. What kind of stuff would you be interested in? It gets more expensive when you buy more stuff. And so they'll work with our sales folk, and they'll figure, you know, budget appropriations and tax and Canada, and they will pick these things somewhat like a menu. When that happens, they will then have access to the site filtered by those verticals that they've purchased. About a quarter of our content consumption is based on web reads. And so people just go to our subscriber site, they look at stuff, and it's really cool. But most of our consumption is through email. And because we publish one to 200 articles across all of these verticals, but still, most people don't want to get 20 to 30 pieces of content in their inbox every day. They want to be a bit more selective. And so what we do is we allow people to customize their experience. So when they purchase their systems, each individual user on that account can go in and say, I want to specify, uh, I want to get emails based on these people. Click, 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 these topics and organizations. And if I don't see it there, I can just do a keyword. Um, in the back, we. This is essentially a percolate query in Elasticsearch, and so we have a lot of flexibility for how they can specify what they care about. But the problem is that sometimes news happens that they didn't expect. So if they've been training themselves to primarily consume on email, we want to be able to give them some way to say, hey, I think you're missing something. Not that you should necessarily change your subscription, but maybe you should go to the website or, hey, check out this news we think it might be important for you. So, for instance, a couple days ago, there was this story that came out that the US Navy changed how it reported UFOs. And I thought that was interesting, even though I did not sign up for the Navy or for the keyword UFO. So I would have liked to be notified of that. The 
problem is going to be that we want to take this on two levels. One, we want to recommend stories because they've, we want to make sure that we recommend things that they have expressed an interest in in terms of their behavior. So they read a lot of Navy stories. So we want to make sure that they're not missing anything. So if they read all the Navy stuff, if for some reason their subscription, because they're picking and choosing, kind of missed a Navy story, we want to make sure that we funnel that to them. But at the same time, we don't want to pigeonhole them. So if they read a lot of Navy stuff, we might suggest the Marines or something like that or something else to try to probe and broaden their interests. One, because you might say ethically that makes them more well-read and a better person. Um, and also, in a sense, we would like to upsell them. So we would like to encourage them to uh, look at other verticals. But also, we find out that the more engaged they are, the more likely they're going to renew. So just we want them to get as much value as possible and realize that value. Now, if we were going to take our content and just do some stupid cluster analysis, and not to say that cluster analysis is stupid, but this one is. Um, we have a tagging system, and I just did a k-means clustering on, um, on a jacquard distance between these things. And it looks neat when you put it inside whatever graphing library I used. So what we want to do is we want to say, look, if all of these blue squares are where we see a reader actively consuming content, well, we definitely want to keep going over in the healthcare blob of content. We want to make sure that they keep getting healthcare, whether or not they've specified that in their email. And we might want to start suggesting education or maybe even defense. They seem to kind of go out towards there. But we definitely don't want to suggest they look at New Jersey. That's a, not a good idea for them. So that kind of idea. Now, we're not going to do this graph walking, but this is more of a notional or conceptual idea of what we're aiming for. We would like to encourage people to uh, keep with the same stuff they've demonstrated interest in, as well as starting to probe around and see how we can broaden their consumption. So as far as the evaluation goes, what we want to do is we want to be able to compare two versions of the system. So from version one to version two, if that Navy reporting story is interesting, well, obviously, we have to define just how we know that's interesting. Um, so we also want to defy, identify users, even if we're doing well in general, we want to be able to narrow down real quick and figuring out why is it working for John over there? Like, why is John getting crap recommendations? So we really want to balance those two. We want to be able to drill down and also do a generally good job to figure out if we're improving or worsening the system with every model uh, revision. Our particular situation, and this goes back a couple years of things that we have tried before, direct feedback doesn't work for our users. They just don't click those rating buttons sufficiently that we're going to get reliable uh, feedback. So not that. Um, we also have dynamic interests. So it's the news and things change. We're in DC. Um, stuff happens, and that's going to change what a, uh, one of our users is interested in right then. And we have to be able to react to that. So really important stories have to be identified. And also, these are really strongly recommended to time. Um, because news keeps happening, we, have to, we can't just recommend something at the beginning of the week. We have to be able to recommend at that time, what's the most relevant content for you right now? What should you be reading? So the evaluation criteria that we initially chose was short-term prediction of news reads. Uh, basically, can our recommendation system do a really good job at guessing what you read right at this time or what you read over a couple of days. So what we do is we look at all the news of the past seven days that you read. And for each one of those consumptions at the time that that user consumed it, we look at, say, 10 recommendations. And of course, that's a parameter. And we're going to discount that by how far down the recommendation it is in rank. Now, it's technically not a rank. It's actually the strength of the recommendation. But for now, we're going to treat those equivalently. So in this rank idea, we're just going to normalize that down so we get a nice round one to three digit number. Um, actually, yeah, between zero and 100. Um, amazingly, this one came out to be 42. So this is kind of what we're going at. This user read a whole bunch of things. Two of them were not recommended at all. The other three were recommended with a mix. And so we sum it, normalize it, we get a number. 
Now, we don't want low scores. Low scores, that means we don't understand what their demonstrated behavior is. So if they're reading a whole bunch of stuff about earnings reports, then you know, stuff about border walls and citizenship questions, we have no reason for doing that. It's as if we had a random system uh, generating recommendations. So definitely low evaluation scores are bad. But high evaluation scores are also bad um, in a different way. It really means that we're falling into that pigeonholing trap where we're not really demonstrating the value of the system. In fact, our recommendations, in a sense, aren't doing any work because they read everything we recommended anyway. So it's not doing any, uh, it's not any use. Now, it's an art right now for us to determine, well, does that mean it's 70 or 65? And it's something that we're just monitoring. So it really is just one of those Goldilocks type of things. Um, so with all that in mind, and with that problem ahead of us, we build a prototype. Our existing infrastructure, all of our published content comes out of a CMS. So our journalists, they throw news into a CMS. Uh, our tech stack picks that up and it throws tags and disambiguation and all kinds of goodness and dumps into an Elasticsearch. Now that Elasticsearch happens to power our search engine. So we already have that available at the start of this project. Um, at the same time, we also have user activity. So this is just first party collection. We know who you are because you're a subscriber that's logged in, and we would like to see what you're opening or clicking on the website and stuff like that. And we dump all of that into a Redshift. So we got all this user data. We got all this search data for our documents. Let's do something and get recommendations. What we ended up with for the prototype is a, it's a standard hybrid system. So it has two components. The first is uh, you can call content filtering or item to item filtering. Um, what we're basically doing is we notice that you like a certain kind of news definable as the document itself. So we would like to continue. We think that you would like similar kinds of news. Now, the reason why we do this is that nobody really wants the old news. So we do have to recommend on kinds of content. So if you liked that US Navy UFO story, it's not like we can recommend that to you tomorrow. We would be doing an awful job. So, this system uh, used Apache Spark to um, push out a cluster model. Basically, we streamed those documents through, we read off our annotations, and we just did this jacquard type of clustering with, I believe it was still a k-means. It was a bisecting k-means, which is fancy and does things. Um, we used standard uh, cluster techniques to figure out what that number of clusters was, like how tight is the cluster, how separated are the clusters, and all that stuff. And the nice thing about Apache Spark is, oh, it makes it so easy to do that because it's just method calls, right? So we wire that up. It pushes out a cluster model after an hour. It doesn't take too long at all, maybe 10 minutes, I don't know. But I mentioned it's a hybrid system. So the other part of that hybrid system is the collaborative filtering. And this is what most people think about with recommendation systems. So this is the kind of thing that um, people who read stuff like me also read that stuff. So I should read that stuff. Uh, Amazon famously does this with a lot of our book recommendations. So I, I was actually recommended a coloring book for turtles, uh, a turtle coloring book for adults. And, um, I guess it's because all my other books were mathy at the time. I ended up buying it because my wife likes turtles, and so I started to wonder if it's even creepier than I thought it was. Um, regardless, what this turns out is a recommendation model. And we have such a cool little workflow going in where we pull this stuff out of our Redshift and our, um, our Elasticsearch for um, pulling out these little tiny data sets. So as far as the essential elements go, we run those documents through that cluster model that we had before, so we're gonna get cluster identifiers. We're gonna join that up, and that's also a nice, efficient um, Spark operation. And then at the same time, we're gonna aggregate up to just get number of views per cluster. And then you dump into the, the collaborative filtering call for Spark, it does its magic, and then you have for every user preferences. How much does it like this cluster, that cluster, that cluster? Um, we can do something similar to what we saw in some of the other talks where we can find like the center of that cluster because we're using k-means. We know it's circular, roughly. And we can say, 
that. That's a really good exemplar of what this cluster is about. Um, and so we get a recommendation model. With the recommendation model telling us how much people, this particular user likes each of these clusters, and this cluster model telling us what the news coming in is in terms of clusters, we can generate a score for how much we would recommend this. And then everybody was happy. Um, it was a pretty neat system. It ran local on my laptop because we could down select on the, or just deal with subsamples. And we were able to run it at production level sizes by spinning up something in EMR on AWS. So we were happy. The evaluation scores were decent. Um, we did some tuning, but we soon uh, just were kind of unhappy with two things. And they're really about, the primary one was that iterating and improving the model was tricky for us. It was more of a moral choice every time we improved the model in the sense of, well, I think the system should be better if we better represent you know, the tag structure in this way or whatever we do. So there are fiddly pieces, but it was, it was very black box and that gave us pause. Um, it was also complex. I mean, it's a cool diagram, but there's a lot of moving parts. And so we were fine with that. A lot of other people do it. But then the real world happened, and for the next two months, we just put a full stop because we were pushing that new search engine into production. So we didn't even think about recommendations uh, for the early part of last summer. And they give us time to think. So the Creative Commons failed me, uh, especially because we're recording this. I couldn't find a good Creative Commons image of people having a good idea, but our team had a good idea, and it was recognizing that talking about this sounded a lot like just basic searches. Like we're talking about what's relevant for our users. And so we could break that down, especially when we said, well, how would we want to explain this? How would we want to defend a recommendation to our product owners or to our users or account owners or something like that? And we kind of settled on these, you know, is it popular within certain groups or across the population? Does it do that collaborative filter dance that gives you turtle coloring books? Um, is it similar to other content you've read? If we can demonstrate that for each of those queries, we actually feel like we have something pretty solid. The question was, could we actually do that? So the production system that we ended up with it just fed into another Elastic. We happen to use Elasticsearch a lot, and um, we just used it for this, although I don't see any reason why other search engines couldn't be swapped in place. Um, what we had to do is we had to figure out, you know, would our qu queries actually be performance and high quality? So the five queries that we went through, you know, one would just be, is it popular amongst readers? And oh my God, that's just the straightforward, just go count the stuff, right? Um, for the transformation, because we have a lot of users against our general content, we rolled it up on the hourly, but we were comfortable with that level of granularity. So really the search was just give me all the reads in the past. We chose two days uh, to determine relevancy just on a time scale. And then we just sum up all the aggregations. And so obviously it's very fast um, and it really didn't cost us anything in terms of that second elastic search we were starting up. We're not really paying for a, much of a footprint on that. So that was good, but of course, popularity is something that is not a recommendation. So it's just one small component. Uh, the next is a popular amongst our subscribers. Now that's actually a different data set. It has a slightly larger footprint because we know when they're logged in and they're clicking and opening on stuff, um, that means we are recording every single thing. So we have to get that out of the redshift Redshift is a columnar database that scales wonderfully in AWS. It's like Cassandra. Um, but that does mean that we have to say, all right, you know, it's worth it to more or less replicate the transformation inside an Elasticsearch. So this better be worthwhile. Um, this particular thing, what's popular among subscribers, well, once you pull on that data, it ain't no problem, right? We're just counting. Um, we targeted and for this entire uh, system, we targeted 50,000 to 100,000 active subscribers with, um, I'd even put that in, for about 20 to 30 reads a day. Uh, reads, opens, and all that kind of stuff. So we 
we're pretty convinced that for uh, growth we would expect, we would just have to scale out the Elasticsearch. If it's mostly queries and can it index the data and can we shard properly, then we're fine. Um, we're also pretty convinced that this probably wouldn't work if our user base was the entire population of China. So that would be a different system. Um, but that's a problem we would love to have. So, um, just to, in the sense of completeness, we decided to have yet another, do these users think it's popular? And so we constrained it by account. Now this did mean we needed one other system that had to be updated by day. So it's not that the footprint was very big, but this was a third data feed that actually had to be updated, every, updated daily. So we did have to incorporate that, but that did kind of tell you the people that you love second most in the world, what do they read? Um, especially because you're all in the same account, you probably all have relatively the same mission statement. So if they all care about the quarterly reports out of Boeing, you probably should too, or at least you should be aware of it because they're gonna be talking about it. The thing that we were most concerned about was the collaborative filtering uh, two-step, um, this community read search. So are people like you reading stuff and it, like what are they doing? So we implemented this in mostly a very straightforward interpretation. So we start with you and we find out what you've read over the past, say, seven days. And then we find out all the people who have read that content in the past 30? Eh. Actually, we don't have to uh, time box that. So there's that other content. Who else has read that? And we'll cap that to about 150 users. And then we'll say, all right, that group of 150, what have they read? Um, we'll filter that out based on we don't care about things like, you know, if you've only bought into like the tax vertical and you haven't bought the New Jersey vertical, I don't want to hear about these folk reading New Jersey articles. I just want them to read about tax and the other verticals that are relevant to you. But this kind of three-step dance was surprisingly fast. Um, it's not parallelizable. Obviously, it is uh, forced to be sequential, but we're still getting uh, well under into sub-second uh, response time for the entire dance. And so we were happy this also gave us the bit of serendipity that we really need to answer that original question of how do we broaden our users' consumption while still honoring you know, uh, their demonstrated behavior. So we also wanted to look at their similar news. So don't care about anybody else in the world but John. If John reads this kind of stuff, we want to keep, we want to make sure that we honor that contract with him. And so what we did for this was essentially a two-step process. So look at all of the news and, that he's looked at in the past 30 days and consider that to be like a profile. This is the kind of stuff that John reads. And just get counts uh, for each of the annotations. So you know, he reads a lot of Nancy Pelosi stuff. He reads a lot about UFOs. You know, just keep that tally. Um, that's a relatively quick lookup, of course. And then take that. 30-day bucket, and then look at all the recent news that matches that. Now, what we do, um, I'm sorry, I don't know the solar terminology, but it's essentially we're creating one long Boolean query and just a ton of shoulds, where each should is boosting on one of the annotations. So it should have Nancy Pelosi with a boost of 40. It should have UFOs with a boost of 10, and so on and so on. And that's going to bias all these results towards one of these things. And it's going to eliminate stuff that doesn't have any of those annotations. Um, this is also nice and fast. So it answers our question, especially because we have to ans ask all five of these search regimes at the same time. So what none of the other queries really do that this does is it answers the cold star problem for us. So the cold star problem just um, as soon as we publish news, zero people have read it. And we would like to recommend that to folk, especially the UFO thing. And so if they read a lot of Navy stories about the UFOs, we are going to be able to recommend that to them regardless of the rest of the world. Um, and that's important for a lot of our subscribers who do a lot of this niche kind of research because there are stories to get like one or two reads, and that's after a few hours. But a lot of this stuff is time sensitive. So if we can get this to the user sooner, they might actually have a competitive advantage in their marketplace. 
And this is an example with corn and boats because it was getting late. Um, we're really happy with this system. And like I mentioned before, we feel a little squeamish about our happiness. I mean, it's simpler architecturally than, our, than that, the Spark-based system. Fewer moving parts, um, data moves around in more or less a single direction. Um, we can explain our recommendations in terms of those five queries. You know, we can say, we recommend this to you because tons of people in your account like it, and it is this similar to your other stuff. I mean, that's powerful for us. And we solved this cold start problem, so that makes us happy. The scaling seems, except for the China case, to just be um, containable within Elasticsearch scaling, which is nice. Um, and it's also very easy to add these additional recommendation components. Like that account thing was suggested um, just a few weeks ago by one of our folks. They're like, you know, that would make sense. And we're like, well, we'll just add it. Um, it was also very easy to um, supply additional constraints. So when people buy into ver certain verticals, they can't see like New Jersey. It's really straightforward to say, don't show New Jersey. Don't even consider New Jersey. So we don't have to do post filtering. You know, I want 10 recommendations, so ask for 100 and eliminate all the jerseys. Um, rather, we can just bake that right in. Go find the popular stuff that's not Jersey, especially with that community search, the popular stuff that other people are reading that's not Jersey. Um, it was just very natural for us to express these kind of uh, these constraints. Um, project managers call challenges opportunities, so I'm going to keep going with that. So it's weird that this makes us happy, and I don't know why. So hopefully some of you guys can tell me, and I really hope that we're missing something here. Um, that's the big thing that we're looking at. Um, but some of the smaller things that we do want to revisit the similar search idea. Because obviously, um, a story, the annotations in a story are actually connected together. Like if I care about UFOs and the Navy, I might actually read about all the stories with that, but I don't care about UFOs and the Army. Like that, who cares? But that correlation, we sure would like to keep around. So that's one of the things that we're looking at. So how do we have to change the representation so we can do that? Um, we also combine these in a very stupid way. We add them all up and divide by the number of components we have. So I think that's five right now. That's dumb. Um, some of those are likely to be more pertinent to users than others. So you can imagine just um, a straightforward gradient descent or something like that, where we're just going to learn for each user what the appropriate weights are. But it gets tricky because there's obvious dependencies. So articles that are really popular for everybody are more likely to be popular for people in your account. And so we would want to weight these things knowing that there are some of these um, these conditional dependencies between these uh, different things. It's not that that's an unsolved problem. We just haven't solved it yet. So that's one of the things that we're looking at as well. Um, but I'm actually going to end it there so we have enough time, because I sure would like to uh, get some uh, feedback. A quick question would be, <clears throat> how much of the navigate, like, how much do you understand that your recommendation system is bringing people into articles versus either the search or external linking? We don't. Um, we recognize that the impression of an article is as important as anything else. So obviously, we know the click-through rate for our recommendations. But we also notice a lot of times that um, and this is actually through user interviews that we hold, that sometimes people are happy with the recommendations there, but they grok the important parts of the uh, article just from the headline and what we call the tease, essentially a short summary, which we return in the search hit. Um, at other times, they might see that, but come back to it at another part of the site and say, all right, let me go back to you know just the news page and I'll click on it then. So. 
The click-through rate is going to be important for us to judge that, but we understand it's kind of more of a holistic thing, especially when we look at placement and things like that. Um, so we would like to consider that in addition to, you know, more targeted evaluation criteria. Could you elaborate a bit more on what you refer to as your or adding serendipity? Um, coming from your recommendations, you're using collaborative filtering, which is not really that um, conducive to uh, serendipity. Um, what other factors have you considered? Um, and there's actually a couple of papers on, on um, serendipity formulas that could be added later on. That, yeah, you know what, you're right. Um, so we consider the serendipity to, you're right, it's more of a constrained notion of serendipity where we're really looking at the volumes for the each, you know, we have this three bucket approach. So um, the consideration is that as we get these volumes, we're trying to control for slightly simil more similar content. We don't wanna go to New Jersey. We wanna you know, stay with the education uh, suggestion. Um, one of the things actually goes back way to the prototype that we've been thinking about. Um, I show that uh, dumb cluster graph thing. It seems to be a good idea, actually, um, where we might recommend content by looking at what your consumption is on that graph and then identify nearby clusters within a certain distance from what you've consumed and say, you know, the average distance is five, so we're looking to go 10 away and, you know, go rank those. And maybe it's just a straight, give me, 10 articles between five and 10 distance between, something like that. Um, yeah, it's something that we're looking at. I, but I, I, you're right to call out that this is definitely a, it's a different form of, it's a constrained form of serendipity. I think you're right. Yeah, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, did you guys, uh, build in any sort of feedback when a, when a user engages with a recommendation, does that go back into the model to reinforce aspects of it? So we don't have any reinforcement for this. Um, not in a, like a reinforcement learning type of sense or anything like that. Because we don't have a model, um, what the reinforcement would be is that we would pick up their click or their open, right? Um, that consumption behavior would flow through our normal, um, you know, through the redshift and all of that, and it would end up in the elastic search that we're serving our recommendations from. Um, so the next time they ask, they were requesting a recommendation, it would now be active against all the content, including that most recent uh, consumption event. Any other questions? All right, another round of applause.